in many ways, my own journey through green chemistry to start uh, Safer Made started with the observation that over 90% of our modern chemistry comes from these fossil and petroleum feedstocks. And the way that we've trained chemists and the way that our systems of production have been optimized in the past 50 to 100 years are all based on the reserves of stable carbon that were formed 100 million years ago. Basically everything we make today, whether it's plastics or chemicals, it's all the carbon that didn't break down. So should we really be surprised when the stuff and chemicals we're making today don't act the way we want for long-term health in the environment? As the petrochemical industry is focused, is forced to make change by economic and social factors, the most important question I think we can all ask right now is how do we ensure that the next generation of chemicals and materials are actually gonna be better for us and better for the natural world. And so we're at an important point in history of the petrochemical age. And we are reaching what those in the petrochemical industry call peak demand for fossil fuels. And recognize this isn't the peak oil that was discussed five or 10 years ago. Um, unfortunately, we have found many cheap ways or many additional carbon stores that we can take out of the ground like fracking. But what has happened um, recently and is accelerating in the, in the world of COVID is that we're reaching peak demand for fossil fuels. And as you can see, fuels are the vast majority of what we use the carbon we pull out of the ground for. Um, and what petrochemical producers are finding is that they're having a harder and harder time money making, uh, selling that fuel. And in fact, <laughs> As uh, recently as a couple weeks ago, the price of, of oil uh, went negative actually in the US, right? So anything below $40 a barrel and you can't make money fracking and selling as fuel. So the first thing that the petrochemical industry does is they look to the places where they can make more money. The most obvious solution with the industry is to shift production away from fuels and towards more chemical products, including plastic, clearly, which generate higher margins. Plastic production, which today out of that 20 or so percent that ends up as uh, chemical products is about four to eight percent of overall oil uh, production. That number is expected to go up to 20 percent. So what you can see is that top part of the, the little oil barrel is growing um, as fuel shrinks because the goal for the petrochemical industry, we, we shouldn't be unclear, is to continue pulling these fossil resources out of the ground and turn them into something, right? What's interesting is that as fuels become less profitable, there's a lot of pressure on the industry. And right now, um, thanks to the work of many folks in this room, uh, it's less attractive to invest in these companies, which means they're gonna have a harder time building this infrastructure for the future. I um, was pleased to read this weekend that some of the the projects for turning uh, fracked gas into uh, plastic are actually now on hold in uh, Ohio and Pennsylvania. Uh, this is the time to act. And why is it the time to act? And the thing I'm going to focus on a fair amount today is because not only are we concerned about the carbon impacts of this oil, not only are we concerned about the long-term plastic pollution, but we need to think about the harmful chemicals that the petroleum uh, industry is also responsible for producing. So let's start just looking at packaging material generally. It's certainly a front and center when we think about plastics, but that's not the only place petroleum is adding to the, the toxic chemical burden. When you look across metal, paper, and plastic, all of them have chemicals of concern. So all of these are chemicals concern associated with these various packaging types. And yes, plastic has a lot of chemicals of concern associated with them, but not uh, so do the other types of packaging materials. It's important to note here that of this list of uh, a couple hundred chemicals, basically all of them are coming from the petrochemical industry, right? So let's take a closer look at plastics in particular to think about where we find chemicals of concern. We see highlighted here are things that match with Darlene's uh, six classes, right? And you'll notice that when we consider the lifestyle of plastic production all the way from monomers to additives, 
um, to how we manufacture and, and then where this plastic ends up at the end of its life, there are a lot of chemicals that are used along the way, many of which have been shown to create significant harm to human health and that inv last uh, a very long time in the environment. So I think it's very, uh, it, it's very apropos that the, what started as Arlene's green science policy focused on something like flame retardants has grown into these six classes and is now branching into this intersection between petroleum, plastic, and poisons. Because as you can see, it really is uh, an intersection of a lot of the things that, that Arlene has been working on. One thing to note here, because you will find that many people, including regulatory and agencies, often say that polymers are safe or inert when it comes to human health. And while that may be true, and I do tend to agree that if you have a high enough molecular weight, the polymers are not going to get, are not very biologically available, and in some cases persist for a long time. What you see here is that there's a lot of, uh, a large amount of chemistry that goes into making those functional products, including all the additives, the process aids, um, and what they degrade to at the end of life. So when we think about the, the toxicity aspects, the harmful aspects of this uh, plastic, petroleum, and uh, poisons intersection, it really isn't the, the polymers we're talking about, it is all of the additives. And that observation that environmental impacts and are often driven by base materials, i.e. Uh, the plastic, the metal, the choice of fiber, but uh, is, is an important thing to recognize. Because when we're talking about uh, slow moving pandemics as Arlene referred to, like uh, global warming, um, those are driven by the choice of the basic material. But where we find harmful chemistry, where we find uh, things that are actually impacting human health, aren't those uh, highest volume based materials. They are in all of the things that make those materials functional. So it really is in the additives and coatings and processes that we put those base materials through that create the poison. And I, the reason why I spend a little time making this, this emphasis is the larger petrochemical discussion often gets lost in, in the very large numbers of uh, barrels of oil and pounds of plastic. And if we only focus on ways of impacting those very large numbers, we're likely to miss the, the other and what I consider equally important impacts that these production, uh, production methods have had, which is the use of hazardous chemicals. So when it comes to the six classes and it comes to the poisons part of uh, petroleum poisons and plastic, I think it's important not just to go after the largest thing in the room, which is is oil or carbon or plastic, but also consider all of the longer term impacts we're having um, using smaller volume, harmful materials to make those things functional. Marty, you were at about four minutes. Perfect. So in the last few minutes, let's just take some time to think about how within the world of plastics that we have today, how do we find the safest plastics? And how do we think about a transition to a safer, uh, material world to fill some of these functions. So this is work from the, the Biz NGO and you can find other work like this. And the reason I pull it up here is it is important to recognize that all plastics are not created equal and they're not all equally bad or good. Certainly uh, both when it comes to human health um, and also even when it comes to how long they're going to last in the environment. My biggest targets for removal and substitution have always been and continue to be the polyvinyl chlorides, the chlorinated polymers in general, halogenated polymers in general, the styrenes, and then lastly, and maybe slightly more controversially, the polyurethane uh, because of the diisocyanates. My favorites on this list, unsurprisingly, are things like recycled uh, PET and polyolefins, um, so your PEs and your HDPEs that tend to have fewer harmful chemicals, although not none, um, and also can either be recycled or break down at least slower than the, the bad actors I mentioned to. But what about bioplastics? Something that folks looking to shift away from petroleum as well as hopefully address other issues are often um, considering. 
I put this up to, to really draw two things that I always take away from any discussion of bioplastics. One, they're still small, and I do think that they need to be a part of our, our future material uh, toolbox. But there's a lot of confusion in bio-based versus biodegradable, and only a few plastics are actually both bio-based and biodegradable. Um, and one thing you wanna know for any claim of something that is biodegradable is how long does it take to break down? how much of it is returned to the environment in a way that can be useful, usually percent CO2 evolved, which means uh, microorganisms are eating it and turning it into biomass. And then what, under what conditions? Does it need an, uh, an industrial composter or will it work in your backyard? So with that in mind, I think it's important to recognize that any use of materials comes with trade-offs. And when we're looking at emissions or life cycle analysis, um, the safest options are not always the smallest options in terms of, of carbon and CO2. So I won't dig deeply here, but what I want to show with this work that came out of Eric Beckman's lab a while ago, actually, is that you do have some great bio-based, biodegradable, under certain circumstance, polymers that are also relatively safe, um, but they often actually don't do as well in terms of, of carbon and land use and other impacts that we might be concerned about. So we should walk away recognizing that we are going to have to optimize across impacts and that we need to have priorities so that we can make trade-offs from an informed rather than uninformed perspective. Last few thoughts that I'd like to leave you with is that this is a time for action. We are shaping the materials economy for future generations with the choices we make today. And to ensure that these are safer, we really do need to understand plastics manufacturing and additives and their role in using harmful chemistries, including ones highlighted by the six classes. And I wanna make sure that even though we're talking about the petroleum plastic poisons intersection, that this isn't just about CO2, but it is about keeping petroleum in the ground. If we don't shift away from this, the most obvious thing for the petroleum industry to do is go to more plastics and more chemical production. Um, and to be honest, that is probably better than just burning it. Um, so we can't make the, the argument based on CO2 alone. And finally, I do think that recycled plastics and uh, safer, uh, pl uh, recycling of safer plastics as well as biodegradable bioplastics are both need to be part of our future materials library. And I'm excited that, you know, that is something that I do focus a lot of my effort on is how we bring these new materials to market. So with that, um, I will wrap up. That's and, 